Hey guys, welcome to No Tucks Allowed. Uh, and this week, of course, I've decided to don the wonderful, the familiar, the white t-shirt today. And uh, to hear and join me about telling us about his favorite color of TV t-shirt, uh, I have also brought along Mr. Big Pod. I am wearing a black shirt. And uh, we've got a guest favorite. today. Oh, oh yes. Uh, and we've got a guest today who I've seen wear this color shirt many a times at this point. Uh, because, you know, if you're wa if you're listening to this show or watching it, you, you've probably also seen some of this guy's content as well. But uh, we have brought along a <coughs> guest today. And that, that is going to that is uh, Derek, otherwise known as DistroTube. How's it going today? Well, I'm wearing a gray shirt. Actually, I own a lot of gray shirts because honestly, if you're going to pick the perfect like neutral color for a shirt, it really should be gray. It should never be white. I think we all agree yeah. on that. Well, there's a story to the white shirt. It's called it was the cheapest one at the shelf at the time, and now I'm wearing a white. The gray shirts are the same price. Well, the gray shirts do not cost any more. Uh, that would help if the gray shirts were actually, were also on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just to let you guys know, uh, Big Pod is currently running Microsoft Windows. And uh, we, I was telling him about this latest and greatest update that I saw a news article about, but of course he tells me that he hasn't installed it yet. Uh, because, well, I'm still uh, stuck in the late in the not updated of 23H2 because you know Windows has auto updates apparently. Apparently, yeah, apparently. But anyways, and nobody they don't update everybody at the same time either, Josh. You know that yes, they roll it out. But well, there has yeah. been one whole feature update between me and uh, 24H2. Well, of course there has hmm. because uh, well. Uh, this article that we have uh, just low-key mentions it in a single sentence, but everywhere else on the internet, everybody's talking about this right now. Uh, and, of course, this uh, this is something that we've talked about previously on the show because Microsoft has now officially installed <coughs> Microsoft Recall on your system. But there's Yay. a couple caveats. There's a couple caveats. Because, Big Pod, I looked at this, and it's opt-in. Really? Yes, nice. it is opt-in. Just like, nice. you know, we suggested that it should probably yes. be. <laughs> yep. And, uh, you know, it comes with a couple of extra things. Like, you can actually uninstall it, and it won't break File Explorer. <laughs> well, there was that bug, so that I'm glad they got that fixed. Yeah. Yep. And uh, when, you, when you remove Recall, it will also remove the AI tools if you want those to also be removed. Interesting. So they're actually that's doing really a good job. Yeah, they're 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 actually taking in like feedback here, and uh, they're pushing it for people. Uh, it it also came with like a couple other things here, so like uh, some clear labels on context menus for to indicate actions such as cut, copy, paste. So I guess they're putting pictures in that context menu now. I haven't looked at a Windows context there menu in a couple of years. Uh, since Windows eleven, uh, the the context menu, right click context menu only had for cut paste delete only had icons i can actually check that myself this time i'm apparently oh, wow. uh apparently on the old version you have like for copy paste cut you have uh you have just icons not an actual uh not an actual like text and like, things like rename share delete they're all just icons no text uh you have some things with text, but those common actions are in a single row, so there is no text around them. Okay, that I I guess. Uh, so I guess they guess, are the text. Uh, this is definitely an improvement. <laughs> oh. uh, they've also introduced a Wi-Fi Seven support for those devices you haven't bought yet, but you probably will be buying them eventually. Uh, and then the ability to easily drag files between breadcrumbs in the file explorer address bar. And if you don't know what I mean by that, uh, if you, t uh, there are, this does happen on some Linux desktop environments with, uh, their file managers where when you, uh, move into a lot of directories, uh, uh it'll condense down like the address space and yep. you'll just get like the three dots. That's what it's talking about with those breadcrumbs, which I guess could be pretty useful. I guess somebody asked for that feature somewhere. So they did it. And here's the biggest part. You now have sudo for Windows. 
Yeah, yeah. pseudo for Windows. <laughs> well, we, we've actually been waiting for uh, uh, pseudo for Windows for, uh, they announced that at least a month uh, ago, so pseudo, I guess it's just now dropping. Pseudo, wasn't pseudo mm-hmm. announced at the at the, uh, the start of the year at the, on their um, build conference really? in May? So we've waited uh, just just ten months then for it. Well, six months. Long. So it they they told already that it won't be in the first feature update because first feature update wasn't was already there for a couple of months or at least. So it was in the next big update. They don't just release big features like that just whenever they feel like it. I'm I'm just glad they're catching up to uh, Linux because I I think Windows users need to experience the uh, error message that they're not in the sudo or file. Uh, the reason and it actually wouldn't wouldn't say that because it's not it's not using a file. The re- it should the reason <laughs> Microsoft is including sudo is because th- there is an increasing number of people who are using things like Winget and similar systems that require some sort of uh admin admin access administrator account so which used yeah, it's all it's all about the package managers really it used a very clutchy method of quitting your current terminal window right clicking on your terminal icon and clicking run as administrator it saves you it saves you what was that three steps that you just mentioned yes now we just type sudo. Close, right click, open. <laughs> yes. And at that point, you have to, have to um, press the the yes uh, on the UAC, the user access control, which... Yes, and <coughs> uh, if you're not logged into the administrator account, you have to input the password for it yes. in an administrator account. Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, they, they save you a couple couple clicks there. Now, so, uh, uh, on the, and... When you're using sudo, you still have to do the yes and the password thing. Well, yeah, I, of course, of course you would, but uh, I think that ultimately it's probably not a bad idea to uh, have some form of privilege escalation that uh, yeah. isn't that is easily like managed because uh, micro- Microsoft has really been like working on like the command line interface for Windows. Uh, that is one thing that I've noticed like over the past uh, at least the past three or four years at this point. Because, you know, they came out with that fancy new open source terminal application that I actually hear is a pretty solid terminal. I've never actually yes, used it Yes, it is. It's really good. Yeah. And, uh, like, they came out with PowerShell, which is basically their own reinterpretation of how Bash should be. Which I'm always a fan when, you know, somebody makes a fork like that. Go like, hey, we, we took inspirations for this project. We just think that it could be done better. PowerShell is and, completely and different than uh, Bash. It's... Like yeah, everything yeah. is an well, object. T- it's actually like it is using an interesting way of thinking thinking of your shell. It's not like it's more of a thing more close to it's a shell based on C sharp than shell like with a completely completely separate way of doing language than anything else. Well, yeah, I I know it's separate nowadays, but when when uh, they were first talking about PowerShell. Uh, they were talking a lot about Bash, probably because you know, Bash was a popular kid. Yeah, probably because of that. <laughs> not, be- not because it was like it was like inspired by Bash, because there is really nothing, nothing like Bash. No, I, I wasn't inspired by Bash, but they knew, you know, fifteen years ago, they knew that there were a lot of developers that liked working on Unix-like yep. operating systems because of the shells that we had that. Obviously, they lack. So, I mean, that's why they created the PowerShell. Obviously, it's nothing like Bash. Everything is an object, essentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, of course, for for us uh, hardware uh, nerds that like to open up Task Manager, uh, your memory usage will now be displayed in mega transfers and not megahertz. Yay! You know. <laughs> I don't know if that matters, but... Uh, uh, that's cool. Technically speaking, it does because megahertz is not actually the correct way of saying it. It's mega transfers per second, but... Okay. Yeah, because, you know, you're, you're not talking about, like, an operating frequency of your memory. You're talking yes. about the transfer that the memory How is many times with. per second transfers happen? And since you have DDR and stuff like that, it's it happens to be a lot different than your than your operating frequency. Yeah, but uh, we have talked in the past about uh, uh, the privacy issues that uh, Microsoft Recall potentially has. And uh, ultimately, 
I still hold the opinion to this day that all that a feature like recall, not a bad idea. Yeah. Like actually. Uh, but uh, we've got this uh, third opinion now. Uh, what do you think about recall, uh, Derek? As long as the user has complete and total control over it, I don't mind the feature. It's just from a, a security and privacy aspect. You know, when, when you're dealing, obviously, with proprietary software, pr a proprietary operating system, you just do worry about where that data is being stored. Uh, is it in? Uh, obviously, it's got to be secure because it's a, a trillion dollar company, Microsoft, behind it. But still, I'm glad everything is opt out and, you know, that not everybody that wants to use this can turn it off because I do think you definitely don't want to force it on people. That's going to push people away from your operating system once you start doing well, that. Well, but I'm like you, I don't necessarily think it's inherently bad if it's done the right officially way. Officially they yeah. were talking about it being most, most compute done locally. Mm -hmm. So that can have a bit of an effect on that equation. Yeah, it, it could. And and I hope that uh it, it if it is running it's by default using like a, like a hardware hardware accelerator otherwise it's taxing your CPU and uh yeah. I have messed around with with this, some of these AI models and uh I have noticed that uh, some of them might take a little bit when you know or might cause your whole system to lag when you know you give it you give it a relatively uh complex input through just basic text. Well, and then, I, yeah. uh it it causes your whole system to go to a crawl because it is trying to calculate everything through the CPU. Well, I've been using now, my... Sometimes the numbers they have to crunch are so big yeah. that, yeah, you need a monster CPU in some yeah. cases. And to... this thing's indexing images. <laughs> well, right. I've been doing that's bi that's big a numbers. lot of that's AI on my laptop because, well, it's a laptop and I'm, and I'm like, I'm carrying it around and I just, I have this idea I'm going to do it and honestly, yeah, on CPU it gets pretty slow really quick, especially if you have any kind of long-term memory. But I, it's not just the CPU though, because it's also when you start incorporating large language models and everything, like you got to think about the drive space. You know, well, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that the more the, these uh, AI tools that everybody's trying to integrate into their browsers and uh, office suites and everything. You know, it's really going to push people to have to buy new hardware. Honestly, I mean, that's, that's kind of a consequence. To... Uh, this may sound a bit crass. Who gives a fuck about about storage space? Uh, storage space that, that is well, well, the people that couldn't afford it, or you know, <laughs> that's are they're going to be the ones. Unfortunately, there yeah. are unfortunately a lot of people but in a lot of parts of the world. But let's remember that storage has gotten extremely cheap, extremely quickly, especially fast storage. Mm -hmm. We're talking about terabytes, or uh, terabytes per what, fifty, sixty euros. Oh yeah, I mean you can get a one terabyte drive for practically nothing these yeah. days. I'm talking yeah, about uh, quality drives. Yeah, yeah. so I'm right. talking quality drives, not not those random random. No off of brands. eBay. What's wrong with those? Come on. You want? Good I mean, brands. Uh, I love draw. I love draw, uh, buying random white label uh, used hard drives off of yeah. eBay. They're always a great deal. Uh, of and course, uh, like half a dozen for twenty yeah, bucks off of eBay. They, sometimes you. Yeah. One one beautiful thing is that uh, as great of a deal as that is, uh, you also get the deal of potential. And since you know we're talking about storage space here, we have a deal where if you download and install this update on your Windows system, there's a chance. You might get that update, those update files in your uh, cache on Windows, and it can't be deleted. Yeah, that's about cache. eight gigabytes, yeah, so, right? Yeah, eight point six three yeah. gigabytes. <laughs> it's just stuck there. You can't even remove it as a, as an administrator. And I'm like, oh, all right. Right. So uh, well, I would hope that the cares? Windows updater is smart enough to know that if you have less than eight point six three gigabytes on your drive, it, it probably shouldn't try to update your system. I would hope it would. Yeah, it doesn't. You'd think. You'd hope. If, if you don't have enough space, I hope it, it would give you even... a warning saying, "Please buy another drive." <laughs> it says something different. Buy another yes. drive and tie it together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, uh, we we all know that everybody that. Uh, 
uh, that pays attention to the show just absolutely loves Microsoft Windows. Uh, but uh, there is an alternative. It's my favorite. There's an alternative <laughs> ecosystem out there, and uh, it's very popular. It it has been growing at an exponential rate. It is up to I think we're positive on two percent uh mar- desktop market share now, according to random results on the internet. <laughs> yep. So, but uh, the 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 largest branded distribution, uh, not the largest distribution, but like name brand distribution. That's what I'm talking about here. Has actually hit a release just last week. Uh, Canonical has announced the release of Ubuntu 24.10, and uh, I don't know what they're calling it. Is it or oracular Oriole? Yeah, or- oracular Oriole. oracular Oriole. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have some difficulty saying that. <laughs> Let me try. Yeah. Uh, so let me see. Yeah, o- oracular Oriole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, th- bear in mind, this is not the LTS release for Ubuntu. This is yep. so. This is one. Of, this is one of those very famous point releases where you get very updated packages, like uh, your. You're running with the Linux 6.11 kernel, which I don't believe is the latest release kernel. I think that's 6.12, or 6.12 yep. is still in Linux next. I, I Well, actually, I haven't updated my Arch system. I'm still on 6.11.1, so it, if it's not the latest, it, it's close. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's pretty close. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're also getting the KDump tools as well for like uh, manage, managing some of those uh, kernel modules. So that's, that's going to be interesting. It's also shipping GNOME 47. Uh, which is something that I'm kind of curious checking out now. But of course, I did a thing and I installed Debian Stable, so uh, I'm not going to get GNOME 47 for a while. <laughs> no, you you get it in about four years. Yeah, uh, it'll probably be like <laughs> GNOME 46 or maybe even 48 by 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 the time uh, the Debian goes through its whole mm-hmm. Debian no. development cycle. Uh, so uh, we'll see we'll see what happens. And so, uh, there on are... the kernel on st- kernel. St- Main v- stable version is 6.11.3 with with uh 6.12 being in the RC3. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I figured I was at least one point behind because I haven't updated in three or four days. Yeah, and uh, they're they're also in- introducing a couple of so- uh, security and the, they say security and usability for software management. That's what it says. Uh, they're they're shipping some improvements in that category of stuff, uh, which basically just means that it's uh, including like uh, some CVE information directly in, into the software, uh, and then you you can also use PPA. You can also have PPAs automatically refresh keys too with a, or uh, you can manually invoke it too, uh, just in case you know like the PPA certificate expired, which is a thing that can happen on Ubuntu systems, especially with when you're using some a PPA that's been running for a while there. And uh, I think the default expiration on like a uh, app t- t- for like a certificate cert- for a key is like two years on Ubuntu. I think I'm not sure on that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, this is just a way to just refresh them without having to manually do it yourself. Now that is interesting. Uh, I mean, that's great that they're doing that uh, with, the PPAs having them automatically refresh the keys. But I also think it's a little bit kind of too late because with snaps now being integrated into Ubuntu, the PPA system, does anybody really use PPAs anymore? I can't remember the last time I used a PPA on any Ubuntu machine. I think it's still, it depends if like, uh, I know Chrome was what everybody needed to add a PPA for, but now Chrome has a snap. Yeah, Chrome has a snap. And everything else. <laughs> right. Uh, I know Firefox still maintains, a P- or Mozilla still maintains a PPA for Firefox and Thunderbird. So you can still get those installed through a uh, right. native dev package, but uh, that's mostly for like their own development. Uh, right. And then I think that a lot of programming languages also offer PPAs too. Uh, so like different versions of uh, Go, Python, Java... Uh, Rust and I guess .NET because this article is saying nope. it too. No, I don't think nope. .NET has their own PPA. They, Microsoft has their own their own uh, D- uh, Debian package server. Okay, yeah. 
so uh, I I think that uh, there there is still a use case for PPAs, uh, especially when especially like if you're looking from like the gaming sphere. So like you get those you get those uh, people that like playing their video games and they're using they're using a system that can benefit from like that newer version of a kernel, and uh, they know about it. They will probably set up the PPA rather than you know downloading the kernel sources and then building the kernel themselves. Yeah, I could see gamers you know having some special needs. Uh needing some repositories that are non-standard. But yeah, that's just like the headline Ubuntu release, uh, you know, shipping out the GNOME. Uh, I don't think that uh, some of the spins actually pushed out an updated ISO yet, last I checked. Uh, it's kind of difficult. I think uh, all of them should. I, I, know I want to say all of them did, except for... Uh, did Kubuntu push, put out one? I, I, I don't... Uh, last I checked their website, I didn't see one, but I hadn't checked it today or yesterday it was the first couple of days i was looking for one and i i highly doubt okay yeah well, that well i know for sure the rest of them did kubuntu was the only one i don't think i saw an iso for i think because i went and downloaded some yeah i think the only one that tends to lag is actually lubuntu the lxqt yeah. ver variant no nah, it, it was out pretty early because i've got the iso for that because i like looking at that one uh I actually really like a LXQ as a desktop environment. Yeah, well, I actually kind of like it too. Uh, and well, I, I like OpenBox, and it uses OpenBox well, by default. So, I think for yeah. this release, they're actually pushing the Wayland build, uh, which is uh, using mm -hmm. uh, LabWC by default. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and Lubuntu is interesting because they don't use any of the standard uh, Ubuntu installers. They don't use the old Ubiquity installer. They also don't use the new flutter based installer they actually use calamaris yeah which is kind of strange that they go yeah. in a different direction uh, lubuntu and kubuntu both use calamaris mm -hmm. and then i think the rest of them just use either yeah ubiquity actually or the, believe uh, they all installer. actually use uh you be uh yeah maybe maybe not uh i think i think there was for a time when when they use a heavily customized ubiquity but i'm not sure yeah, I, I, they've they moved to the Calamares, um, not this release. They, they, actually, they've been on it for at least two or three releases. Okay. For a hot minute. Yeah, and Lubuntu's always been, of all the spins, they tend to deviate a little bit more. You know, they, they're not afraid to take some chances on some things. Well, they also uh, have a very specified purpose of, like, being able to run on these lightweight systems, too. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Uh, they, when you go to like open up your installer, they don't want to take the time. They don't want to wait to, wait to, for the t to take the time for like the snap package to unpack itself and then and then open up. Which uh, if you run if you cold boot a snap, that's the first thing that it does. That's why it takes a while. Uh, it's got to unpack itself in, into your system memory and then because it's a compressed file format to begin with, and uh, th that that does does take a little bit of time. But uh. And their goal is to have a very lightweight operating system, which I believe, last I checked, they uh, they were able to boot and operate on less than two hundred megabytes of memory on into a full graphical session. Lighted, that's not like launching Chrome. It would or shock me. Yet. Because with if you're using OpenBox as your window manager, OpenBox can definitely run on you know two hundred megs of memory and then you know as long as you don't have any weird background services now they're going to have some stuff running in the background but as long as you manage that stuff in a reasonably responsible way yeah it, you can probably get away with 300 megabytes of ram maybe one thing i noticed uh on the whole ubuntu flavor thing there is actually a lot more flavor than last time i checked oh Two yeah more. Yeah, because the uh, Cinnamon Edition yeah. came out, what, just uh, two or three uh, versions ago. Unity came back just two or three versions. So, yeah, if you haven't checked in the last year and a half, you've got at least two new editions that weren't yeah. there until recently. I knew of both of them being in development, but I didn't know they were promoted to flavor status. Yeah, yeah we are yeah. actually for those up of you to that... 10 flavors now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, And then you remember, Ed Ubuntu went away for forever and then came back uh, yeah and so they they've got a lot and of spins of course now. uh the still remaining the my personal choice ubuntu mate yeah now ubuntu mate still hang on a minute big pod 
if you want the still remaining that's been a flavor for longer, yeah, Zubuntu, which is yes. so hot and fresh that's still shipping the same version of XFCE that's shipped for the past three releases at this point, I think. <laughs> uh, no, more than that. XFCE hasn't had a major update. Yeah, uh, it's been... Uh, we, we've had XFCE 4.18 for a while. Like I, I think... Even last Debian stable shipped 4.18. 4.18. <laughs> yeah. So it's been, it's been around. <laughs> but it's tested though. It's stable. Yep. At least uh, I I am written on the website off uh Ubuntu Mother. It means a lot to me. I was of a course, part of the of team course. for a time. Yeah, one of the cool things with the uh the, for the flagship edition of Ubuntu 24.10 is it's the 20th anniversary of their very first release. So there's a lot of really cool stuff, kind of like a throwback to the old days. So you've got one of the old school brown wallpapers in here. You've got the startup sound. You remember those first six years of Ubuntu? Oh, they always had a startup I, sound. I remember. At, that was my- and it's got one of that, that Warty Warthog uh, version 4.10 from 20 years ago. They use the exact same startup sound. And this thing's like 30 seconds long. I mean, like it's, a, it's a very long hey, startup. I song. remember like <laughs> way back in the day, uh, I just hitting the power button on the computer, just going and doing something else. Here's a startup sound. Hey, your computer's turned on. <laughs> yeah. That's actually what the sound you is for. You can disable it. I mean, they have it as a toggle where you, you can toggle the startup sound off, but it's just neat that it's there. It's on by default. So those of you that have been around Ubuntu for a while, I, we'll have a bit of nostalgia. Mm, that yeah, I'm gonna have to check that out because you know, I... one of the wallpapers also includes three Ubuntu logos side by side. You get the very first one, which was the circle, uh, with the you know, three guys holding hands, you know, yeah. three people holding hands or what, and then you got the modern one that they were using till just like six months ago, and then you got the brand new one that they just switched to like last release. So pretty neat. Well, I- I'm glad that they're taking time to. J- to you know, just come up with the, those little Easter eggs that, there, because uh, Ubuntu, yeah. Ubuntu has a very long and storied history in like the Linux desktop space. Yeah. Uh, if you, I we've mentioned this before, but uh, when Ubuntu came out, it really was that big of a deal. Uh, because uh, you know, oh, yeah, you know, it definitely was. Uh, you install you installed a system and a Linux system. You just got to a command line environment. You, you because you know, uh, Xinit didn't exist yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, a gnome, gnome session manager didn't exist yet. So you had to start this thing, this stuff up yourself. And, uh, that's something you had to learn how to do. Whereas Ubuntu, you just hit the power button and you got a nice graphical login screen. Yeah. Mind is blown. We talk about, we we talk about the Linux desktop now, maybe possibly having about 4% of the, the total market share. Well, that first two percent was largely due to what Ubuntu yeah. did from the years like two thousand and six to two thousand and eight. They got a lot of people to try Linux for the first time that never would have and thought about for Linux before. Today, I would hazard the guess. It's all the Steam Deck. I'll hazard the guess that still, no matter what Steam Deck does, <clears throat> a mm-hmm. good, good eighty percent of the those four percent is. Ubuntu. Really? Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't have thought yeah. that. But you may be right. Oh. Uh, I don't have a Steam Deck, so uh, you know I've never purchased one. I should get one eventually, even though Steam I'm not a gamer. Is a thing. It's. I don't think it's that much of an impactor as all the other ways uh, Ubuntu gets used because it's not one of the things that Ubuntu gets that no, almost no other distro gets besides Red Hat. Is they are used in enterprise, right. yeah, even on the desktop. So it's just like you manage the ser- you manage the servers at work. You don't want to come back home and just manage Windows. You want to manage something that you know how to fix, and you've worked professionally in these Linux environments. So, and I'm not just talking just that uh, Linux laptops that are used for work, most of them run are almost Ubuntu. Yeah, most of almost all of them are Ubuntu. Yes. Unless, That's what unless I'm talking about. A lot of OEMs, yeah, a lot of OEMs default to installing yeah. Ubuntu if they're going to install Linux because uh, Ubuntu, out of the box, is easily the most 
professional and polished. Like so many Linux distributions look like they're held together by duct tape. Like they've got all these disjointed parts that don't make sense together. But really, everything on Ubuntu as a whole, if yeah, nothing it just else, looks... Ubuntu has the whole yeah. out of the box experience thing, where you pull right. out your laptop. It rivals uh, something like a, a MacBook. Yes, or you know, Windows. Uh, if you, you pull out right. your laptops, you turn it on, you get you. You are asked what username do you want? Yeah, what password do you want? Mm -hmm. What language? What keyboard? Then you're thrown into mm -hmm. the desktop. Mm -hmm. Personally, I keep a USB stick of Ubuntu LTS, the latest LTS, always. Like in my laptop bags, I, if I'm going somewhere, I just keep that around because, you know, I, I'll get these people that maybe want to try Linux or they have an old machine that's, they, they need something installed anyway. It doesn't matter what I put on it. I just, Ubuntu LTS is what I default to when other people need Linux. Like I just, that's the one I go to. And it seems to work for everybody. I, I've, I've never had anybody complain, well, man, I can't believe you put that thing on my machine. And usually I never hear from them. Here's the one thing that I find that Ubuntu does better than any other distro out there. Out of the box, it actually looks good. Yes. Like, yeah. Well. Like, like uh, the, only, the only other distro that comes relatively close is Fedora Workstation, but then again, that's just because, you know, they're shipping default no. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot with Ubuntu, Ubuntu in the early days, you know this, Josh, they really spent a lot of time oh, yeah. on font rendering where other distributions did not. Uh, like the difference between font rendering on Debian versus font rendering on Ubuntu, like it, it well, was not you, you could actually like, read the font on Ubuntu. <laughs> the user right. experience. That's the thing. User experience. Uh, and then Ubuntu even created their own font family, which is a fantastic font family. Their monospace font is probably the best monospace font for those of you that spend time in a terminal or a text editor. Very easy on the eyes, especially if you're kind of older. Personally, in yeah, these I days, I use Microsoft's uh, monospace font, the one that you find in the in their terminal. I use it on Linux. As yeah, well. but that's not in the repos. No, uh, but it is uh, installed on, on my distro. By out of the box. Okay. So that's what I use. I mean, it, it makes sense. But like, Ubuntu's if you care theming. About the familiarity. But, like, yeah, yeah. The, the theming looks good. Like, uh, the every that single icon application. Set. Love it. Every single I application no. that you pull, that you open up, basically looks like it's themed correctly. There's, not, there's nothing that looks out of place. And, uh, you, I'm surprised I have to say that. We're on Windows 11. Why why do you have three different UI toolkits installed on, on a default version of Windows? I'm sorry. Yeah. Honestly, well, I still have I to poke fun at that. I don't care about <laughs> the fact that they, you you care about UI toolkits, honestly. Well, it's it's not that I particularly care about it. It's just that it's something it's something it's one of those things that you just notice. The problem and with it's something Windows. that somebody that's new to the system will also notice. Fun fact that it's more yeah, UI this application than three. Look like this and this one. The problem with Windows yeah. and its uh, toolkits, which there are more than three, let's be let's be clear, is that there is all the talk about backwards compatibility, backwards compatibility, this because of that, and they had they ha wanna be as much backwards compatible as they want to be, so they have to they have to still keep G GDI, they still keep WinForm, still keep. Uh, what, VPF, UWP, and all the versions of that they exist, which is a big problem for, honestly, a big problem for Microsoft, in my opinion. So, uh, talking about uh, Canonical is great and all, but uh, of course, uh, we are ultimately a technology podcast. We're because you know this is no tux allowed. We're not supposed to talk about these Linux things, guys. All right. Although we're probably about to delve into a whole bunch of Linux stuff, but. Uh, we've got to hit the hot button topic in the technology space right now, which is still AI. It's going to be AI for as long as, you know, uh, Wall Street investors are willing to care about it. Yep. And, uh, of course, uh, <coughs> education is also popping up a, a little bit here. As, you know, a student decided he was going to uh, do some homework and uh, use AI to assist with it. And uh, the school did not like that. And uh, so they, they automatically fail, failed, saying that, you know, uh, citing plagiarism and all the common complaints about uh, creative work with AI. And yeah. the the parents did the American thing and they filed a lawsuit <laughs> <laughs> saying that, hey, uh, the school has no policies specifically mentioning AI. <laughs> uh, instead, it bans unauthorized use of technology during an assignment and 
unauthorized use or close imitation of language and thoughts of another author and the representation of them as one's own work. Uh, they also say that the student did not disclose his use of AI in in the work as well. I assume that this was some kind of essay that the student wrote. Uh, they don't yeah, talk they, about it as yeah. to what the actual work was, but just yeah, for and that's what just a common reminder yeah. on like basic practices when you're writing an essay, and even if you're quoting your own work, you still put that citation in there. That's how you yes. skirt yeah. the plagiarism argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I that's why it's really hard for me to defend this guy, yeah. uh, this kid. Uh, is if he would just said, "Yeah, Chat GPT wrote this paper for me," then they probably wouldn't have come down on him hard at all. He may not yeah. have got a, a good grade. They might have made him rewrite the paper, but there would have been no discipline, right? They they wouldn't have, you know, had any kind of disciplinary action. So that that's my only thought on that is if he'd have done it the right way, this is not an issue. I like I have current experience with school system and uh, specifically in Slovenia, not in US. But one of the things I'm I'm doing very hard is I'm not using any kind of AI for simple reason because I don't know how to how to the citation on that. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. one of the worst things you can do is have yourself as the one who you're quoting because. That's a fun citation to write, and when when yeah, half of your paper is your where... own your own thing, and previous works and your own things, yeah, that's fun citations. Well, you guys have noticed, being uh, YouTube content creators, when you upload a video, it asks you, does this contain any AI generated content, yes. images or you know, yep. text or whatever, you know, and the reason is because obviously YouTube is filtering the or, or you know it's got its algorithms that is it's searching through all the content and they want to know what's been plagiarized what isn't so they ask you to, to state up front if it's ai generated and this is standard with pretty much any site yeah. where you upload text amazon if you're gonna you know, publish a book on amazon now uh they require you to actually acknowledge if you used any ai generated content and in it. because again they're searching through it and they're gonna know it's ai generated anyway they just want you to state and we're hey, proud yeah, to i say used ai to write this we're not using ai for anything of, of this podcast just very clever yeah, algorithms we, yeah uh like the closest that we come to ai is uh, yes, I am testing with paid paid advertising. So uh, if you came to us through Twitter, that's how you got here. <laughs> uh, I paid Possibly. Twitter to, the to point post where ads. <laughs> Possibly. If you do anything with text, anything with art, anything with video, it's gotten to the point where you just need to know if you're using AI for any of it, you need to state yeah. up front that, yeah, this was AI helped me make this. Otherwise, you could be in trouble like this kid. Yeah, and... Uh, this this does like raise some issues uh, with like the school system because uh, you gotta remember, uh, teachers are there to teach, not necessarily yes. like interpret copyright law. Well, but so, still, they should yeah, be able to do that. Yeah. Well, but this is no different than a student copying something straight from another yeah. textbook or you know or whatever from another so paper. It's the same thing, right? It's so, plagiarism, yeah. not copyright, and those are Either two way. things. Yeah. That are kind of separate but the same yeah but the point is this kid didn't have an original thought of his own and you can't let somebody turn in a paper that basically he didn't write at all he, he, like if he had to defend this in like an oral argument he couldn't because he didn't write the dang paper right so he's not actually learning anything that's true ultimately it comes out <laughs> to a question of uh, do, is the student trying to learn something or is he just trying to get an a and we're going to see a lot more of this in like our university systems where there's going to be a lot more oral exams, you know, instead of written exams, because the more and more the AI comes into play, you know, sometimes you just have to ask somebody straight up to defend an argument, you know, instead of just writing a paper because you can't trust where they got the information from the paper. Well, uh, you see, uh, a certain YouTuber made made a video linking to this article here that I have printed out in my hands because, you know, I actively hand this out to people. I'm certain that uh, you've uh, certainly have read a critical guide to, to a field guide to critical <laughs> thinking before. Uh, yeah. And uh, I do recommend uh, that if you take that, if you take the time to decide that you want to figure out how to like make a good argument, 
uh, find this paper. This is called A Field Guide to Critical uh, Thinking by James Litt, printed in the fall of 1990. It's been around a, it's yeah. been around a minute. It's it's worth while reading. That in, and when I mentioned that in, in whatever video years ago on, on the DistroTube channel, uh, I had actually had that paper probably since the 1990s. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I kept a copy <laughs> like that. And I wanted to share people. I thought it was one of the, the best things I'd ever read on the Internet. And uh, I, I don't know if it's something easily found still on the Internet. It, it still shows up in Google, I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, as long as it shows up, because I, I do think yeah, more people should know how to critically think, how to put together an argument. Just looking at yeah. it, that is basic like basic things are in here. I don't know what's so, what's so. Well, a lot of people when they, you know, especially these days, a lot of people will make an argument. They'll make a statement. All right, defend that statement. Well, I can't defend it. it, it what I said well, is true because I said it. You, you ask you them know, to defend, you, and they you just tell you to Google it. <laughs> right? Or yeah, <laughs> just take my word for it. I found it on the internet, or you know, you get a lot of weird. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. I think my cup is leaking. Social media, social media has changed the world in such a negative way in this aspect is now anything said on Facebook or on X is taken as actual yeah. fact. Like people actually, I've seen people actually use Facebook as a source yeah. in a, like a legit paper. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook is not a source. Well, it can be <laughs> if it's one of sources for specific information. Yeah. And if you're well, using things like uh, doing things like social studies, which I don't know, is that really a science? Yeah, well, it, it counts. Yeah. Then something like Facebook can be a really good source. Well, I could see that. Yeah, any kind of social science. Uh, you know, I, I could, obviously, social media is a big part of the social sciences now, as if you're studying human behavior. And oh. for all of you who may take this the wrong way, I was just joking. Yes, it is a science. <laughs> okay. Yeah, th that's an important disclaimer to make because. I mean, it's a legit science. It's definitely counts. Like, it's not a pseudoscience, it's a real thing. Yeah. yeah and, uh, you know, since, since we're talking about like old videos here by, by this DistroTube guy, uh, Derek, what do you even do on your channel these days? Because uh, you started out, you you were just reviewing Linux distros, and then you got to talk about window managers for like the longest time. That's probably like how the major, at, at least a quarter of your audience found you. Yeah, and then and at some since point, then it's been stuff. Yeah, there there were guns from <laughs> the channel at one point, right? There's comedy skits. There's rap songs. There's me playing the trombone, there's me playing the recorder, me playing the harmonica. I think I've sang a couple of times. There's, there's a I lot know of weird you, I things. I know you've definitely sung the free software song. I remember that quite clearly. I have clearly. sung at least twice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, uh, when I started my channel, uh, obviously it was all distro reviews and window managers is how I started the channel. Like, that was the two things I focused on. Um but, it, you know, at some point, I've used a, pretty much every window manager. <laughs> like, there's there's a lot of window managers that I haven't tried, but they're typically really obscure things nobody's ever heard of, or they're so old, nobody uses them, probably nobody should use them. But any reasonably popular window manager or desktop environment, you know, I've, I've tried over the years. Oh, trust me. I've got, like, this bookmark folder called the Window Manager Project because that was going to be a mm -hmm. goal where I did a video on every single window manager on Linux. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, first of all, good luck finding good luck finding a, a few of these in repositories. Uh, in fact, good luck even finding the Git repository or SVN repository or uh, the code well a code parsing repository that you can download this thing from because it doesn't exist. Because the only way you can get it is if you happen to find it on an old piece of paper somewhere. <laughs> but oh, at least half of the window managers that I've uh, taking a look at on camera, at least half of them, I would say I really wouldn't recommend anybody using because they're so old, some of them, and so unmaintained and do have bugs. So, I mean, you do run into that. Yeah, but, you know, it, this is the Window Manager Project. The, it is the goal of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. I, I haven't counted, like, the bookmarks in a while, but I was definitely well over 100. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I know that you... 
I know I would uh, take some of these. I would reference them. Go. I would punch them into YouTube, and there'd be a district two video on it. <laughs> like, uh, what was it? Yeah, JPOC uh, WM uh, was one of them. Which one? Uh, oh, JWM. Yeah. Is that um. Uh, KWM is the uh, the puppy uh, uh, Linux uh, window manager. Yeah, J- the one that they default to. Yeah, JWM. JWM. It's very open box like. Yeah, but, but it's really really cool. Yeah, and then uh, you know Fluxbox and all of its alternatives. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. like Fluxbox, all the boxes. Blackbox. <laughs> there's a bunch of open box yeah, the, clones. Yeah, there, yeah, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of box window managers, and uh, I even went through taking some time to look at like uh, Wayland compositors too. Uh, which I can t- I can tell you right now, Waymo Dad still works and is surprisingly functional, but you need to use an old version of Haskell to use it. <laughs> so uh, good luck, Arch guys. Well, yeah, because it's a compiled language, so yeah, you're always gonna have to compile it to that set of libraries. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I-, I wish somebody would take up the project, <laughs> like it, you know. The person that abandoned it basically was hoping somebody, like the community, would actually step in. There would be more people interested in taking on that project. But, you know, so so many people involved with Xmonad are obviously, they invested so much time learning about the X windowing system that it's hard to convince people sometimes to, hey, can you start learning about Wayland and yeah, do this I mean, other thing? It's it's in the name, Xmonad. Uh, right. let's, let's use the X server to write as many monads as we possibly can because no one knows is, what a monad this is. This is really the problem with uh, projects like Xmonad, like Awesome, and a lot of these old school tiling window managers that you know so many people use still on Linux. I mean, they got a ton of users. Uh, at some point, they need to migrate to Wayland, but there's really doesn't seem any interest in the people that have ever contributed code to actually because there's a very serious investment involved with learning about Wayland and, and like moving some of this stuff over to Wayland. Nobody wants to take the, take on that work. It's just a well, ton of work. Well, my opinion has always been if they don't, they don't. Yeah, it, yeah because it, in many cases, it would be easier just to use a window manager that's already for yeah. Wayland than to try to convert some of these existing. But I do yeah, have a I question think... for you, DT. Since we're on the mm-hmm. topic of Wayland, have you in the recent times tried Wayland for content creation no uh, I, I it's hard for me to use anything on Wayland on my computers other than gnome it's the only thing that really works i'm sure gnome probably would be fine for me i just i haven't done any content creation on it though well kd works gnome works josh probably knows of things that work that aren't kd or gnome I, that i don't <laughs> I, I've tried all the uh, the window managers. I, I can't get any of them to run uh, in Wayland on my home computer. The hyper- if they w- work properly, I'd try Hyperland. I run Qtile, which Qtile has support for Xorg and Wayland. I can't get it to work on Wayland, not on my home computer. I know that Hyperland does have an NVIDIA fork that does supposedly work, but I've never actually tried it myself. Yeah. I, you know, every two or three months, I install Hyperland on my machine and just to see if it will work, and it never does. And I go through the Arch Wiki because it tells you about NVIDIA users, you know, run these commands, these two or three commands. It's, it doesn't do anything for me. You know, and I'll spend like every two, three months, I'll spend about 30 minutes trying to get it up and running on my home computer. It, and I've never had it work for me. So one day it might work, and then, then I'll try it. Yeah. Well, Same thing with Qtile. One day, w- once Qtile on Wayland actually works on my machines, I'll probably just keep using Qtile and just move over to the Wayland version. Or it could become normal and switch to GNOME or KDE. Yeah, I've never been a GNOME user, ever. I mean, I... I then KDE. Since I switched to Linux, I've never used <laughs> GNOME. I've never used a full desktop environment. So I, I don't think I, that's likely to happen, Big Pud. It would be weird, like 20 years you know, after the fact, all of a sudden become a desktop environment user. Why not? But may, maybe you'll convince me. Why not? Know. Honestly, why not? Because I like uh, creating my own desktop environment. I, I like putting the pieces together myself. That just... That just you know, I get to pick and choose honestly, exactly every part. Way too much work. No, so, when you have your own configs, you only have to config it one time. Save the config, and yeah, you know, it's not. I don't config Qtile. I can't remember the last time I, I, I edited the config. Probably six months ago. To me, at that's least. just another part I have to maintain myself, and another part that that could break on me. Yeah, but there's a trade-off when GNOME has an update and they move to the next version of GNOME and they make some design decisions care. that you don't like. 
Well, exactly. You might, but some people will. I won't have that problem with Qtel or whatever desktop, my desktop environment that I'm running because it's mine. I, I got to choose all the components anyway. Well, one thing that I can appreciate is that you can do that with with a dedicated window manager. And, of course, you can also just choose not to update GNOME. Uh, yeah. It, it yeah. Ulti Ultimately, at the end of the day, as Linux users, we have that power. Which it's just like we don't like the update. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do the update. It also depends on what distribution you're running. That like if I was a Ubuntu LTS user or a Debian stable user like Josh, you're not getting those updates anyways. Like if you're on Arch, you're getting every single latest release of GNOME no, or KDE. If, if you're using Arch, some of those you're can asking be, for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and, you know, some of those things are buggy when they first come out. And, you know, you may not want those. And Josh meant you're asking for it in general if you're using Arch because me and Josh definitely have have negative opinions of Arch. But there, there's a reason why you see a lot of people using distributions like Arch and Gen Two, and you know those those kinds of distributions. They typically are window manager users. They're typically they're not running full GNOME or full KDE. Uh, and typically, you'll see those kinds of people running more stable, long-term release well, distributions. There's definitely a, a connection with it. There's actually an awkward point about Gen 2, because a lot of the Gen 2 content creators, yes, they are window manager users. But in my experience, just like, you know, just hanging out in like the Gen 2 IRC room, there's a lot of people actually using these full desktop environments. Because I can tell you right now, uh, there's somebody in the, yeah. R in the IRC channel right now that just asked why it takes so long for Qt Web Engine to to uh, compile on his KDE environment. <laughs> you're like, well, for one thing, you're compiling a web browser. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sh should be done in eight hours or less. Yeah, it takes me about uh, four and a half hours on average. While the Chromium compiles faster. Well, you got a pretty good machine then. Uh, it's just a it's just like a 12th gen i5. And Firefox? Uh, Firefox is half an hour. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Not a problem at all. Uh, no, uh, like the the longest thing that it yeah. actually takes me to compile on, on Gen two system is, uh, it has to be Chromium, it is literally the longest thing because uh, not even GCC. Yes. Takes, yeah. GCC takes like forty five minutes. Yeah. I mean, and then yeah. you can do the average thing. Pretty much any Chromium based system, browser, but, uh, it, it takes forever. Yeah. Because, you know, Chromium is awesome. Yeah, because when I first... Uh, yeah. Because when I first switched to using Brave as my browser on Arch, and this was two, three years ago, I remember I mistakenly built it from source. I The AUR package compiles. There is a binary package, but I chose... You know, I just compile it myself. It can't take that long, right? Yeah. Yeah. You start no, it like, morning, uh, come back later in the evening, and it might be done. I remember when Solus first came out as like a distro. This was back when, you know, before I learned what mm -hmm. learned actual things about Linux, I decided I was going to install it and give it a test trial. And I was a Google Chrome user back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. If, I'm sorry, Mozilla fanboys. Mm -hmm. I betrayed you for for a short period of about seven months because, you know, this Chrome thing came to Linux. And it was and it was sounding pretty cool. Uh, I hit I hit the uh, pause mm -hmm. button in like their third party software software and I went to Google Chrome and uh, I hit the install button and it just didn't seem like it was doing anything. It turns out that was compiling Google Chrome in the background. <laughs> so uh, I closed it, didn't care about it, decided that eh, this is just a broken feature, whatever. Cool, cool operating system. Otherwise, let's just uh, go back to our Ubuntu 1404 install. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know what one day i came back and it's like well let's just uh see if we can get this thing to pop up like an error message and uh, i just left it sit there and then i came back like two days later it was still compiling so then i left and then i came back and finally it was installed <laughs> they're like hey this thing worked so i so i take mm -hmm. a moment to hop in like their irc mm -hmm. channel and go like hey why does why did this take me like four and a half days to install oh because of compiling from source i'm like oh well, that makes sense now. <laughs> well, it's real easy to tell when something's compiling. All you have to do is is pull up HTOP, you know, check your CPU. <laughs> I mean, if it's pegged well, at 100%, you see, you're probably compiling something. 
You, you got to remember, this was a uh, Farmer Josh back in the day. Uh, I didn't know this, or I didn't think about this, because when I hit power button on computer, yeah. I would just log in, check weather report, log out, go outside. Hmm. <laughs> I wasn't really like a computer power user until I bought a system that required something newer th- than what the Debian, Debian kernel supported. <laughs> That's when I actually started learning uh-huh. Linux, as people s- call it. Oh, well, you okay. were asking, uh, Josh, about what, what my content has been about these days and how it's changed from, you know, seven years ago when I started the channel till now. Here in the last several months, obviously, AI has been a much bigger topic. AI wasn't even a topic seven years ago, but I do a lot more with those kinds of tools. I've noticed that I'm a lot more embracing of this kind of new technology than a lot of people for some reason and then free and open source software. A lot of people fear these AI tools. I don't. I actually really like them. I, I think they're neat. I think they're extremely useful in some cases and they're only going to get more useful as uh, more and more of these things arise. So what you're saying is that you don't care that a- that uh, the majority of AI uh, bots out there are supposedly stealing content from everybody else and just regurgitating it towards you. Yeah, it's one of those weird situations where, and I know we have copyright laws. Yeah, but can you really steal information? You know, like information kind of just wants to be free anyway. And I'm not. I you know, really don't say that follow it, you know, the whole copyright idea laws are shouldn't exist. I don't follow that. But a lot, but it tends to, like it's hard to create these kinds of programs, these large language models, and then restrict them on the information they're going to go out and search and you know add to their <clears> database. Like it's, I, I don't think you could have gotten around that. I just think naturally that's always where it has had to lead. Yes, well, I when think... we're talking about uh, self-learning AIs, because then they're going to be like us humans. But about these highly curated ones, I'm not so sure that's not that's not a proper possibility, especially because something like self-learning AI will be able to actually differentiate between an actual, what they created is a, is a, uh, is a, a copyright stealing or a pl- uh, or a or basically a copy of something else, something this current, which have no intelligence at all, are not able to. And I'm honestly looking, honestly, mostly looking for the day those kind of AIs happen, not not this kind. Right. And I think a lot of this has to play out in court yep. as far as some of the legality issues still have to be sorted out. And it will get sorted out very quickly. Um, so well, yeah, I, especially I'm not too worried you. about it. Like, I, I don't... Hey, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, especially here in, like, the United States, States too, because uh, if it goes through, through a court process in the United States and, you know, it actually comes down to a judgment or a ruling, which it will eventually at some point. You can't settle forever. Uh... uh there's a lot of nations that actually just copycat based off of U.S. copyright law, so they they might just take that to heart too. Uh, I know, for example, uh, mm, Canada very very I, recently. There is a difference between precedence and law, which should be very much uh, a knowledge. So, if something would be written in law, yes, but if if just a precedence said by a court, I'm not so sure it would be followed by other countries. Well, They would yeah. want to either either create their own precedents or even if they have the concept of precedents in their in their law, which there exist countries who don't have the concept of precedents anyway. And there's some companies that just don't have any copyright yeah. legislation to begin with too, as you know, we've uh, discussed many a, a few, a few yeah. times with Steve back when he used to be on the show. But uh, yeah. it it is interesting. That, it is uh interesting that t- to hear that you're embracing AI too. I've messed around with it a little bit myself. Uh, uh, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I I do I have made use of it to like bounce ideas off of it, mostly for like my own Dungeons and Dragons campaigns. Because heaven forbid you can come up with an entire world, but sometimes you spend so much time on the world you forget to make your bad guys. 
or the other way around. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, well, sometimes it helps you just run like into the, the situation uh, where you're, you're no, sometimes you run into the situation where you're researching something that's a very deep topic and you just want a summary of it. And sometimes it's just easier too. to ask Olama, hey, can you summarize the FFmpeg uh, man page for me? <laughs> I don't want to read the whole dang thing. Can, can you give me a summary? Yeah, can you give me a summary of it? I mean, yes, of course, sometimes the summary is just going to be wrong because, you know, AI is still not perfect. And it's not going to be perfect. Well, you can tell while. you can tell an AI what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And the cool thing is you can tell the AI what you're exactly you're looking for. I'm I'm not going to go search it myself. You go search for it. And that that's yeah. kind of neat. Yeah, that is true. And uh they they they've actually been steadily getting better. Uh the the big the biggest concern that I have with uh artificial intelligence is uh its effect we we're all, we we touched on this just a little bit earlier, but uh it is effectively uh working as like an alternative to education. And uh, I think, I, yes. so I have been delving a little bit into Warhammer 40k lore, and uh, like most typical science fiction uh, stories, uh, there's there, they went through a whole phase of war with AI, <laughs> so uh, uh, this is like yeah, somewhat fresh in my head that's... here, how long until this happens? <laughs> uh, are we going to get to, are we going to get to the grim dark future yet? <laughs> I have a feeling no. AI in reality no. will be much more subtle than that. Yes. And why it may be the maybe problem bad, is it's gonna when it comes to that it's gonna be so far more advanced than us, we won't even know what hit us. There will be no and war. The problem that with these people that, that think about the whole Skynet Terminator doomsday scenario. They kinda of underestimate imagining the whole the whole thing. Well, they're imagining this this AI that is like just this perfect entity. Well, you got to understand that these things are being created by human beings. Human beings are incredibly flawed. Yes. You know, the programming that is going into these these AI tools, you, you can already see that they're incredibly flawed. Anyway, yes. the idea that we're going to create something that is going to take over the world. What uh, about an AI that writes that. an AI that writes an AI that writes an AI that lands on its own? Well, the original AI was going to be filled with bugs because we programmed it. Yeah, it's going to pass well, bugs but, on to, It's going to be but flawed, But after, too. I don't know, hundreds of iterations, it could be perfect for all I know. Big Pod, we can't get audio on Linux right. You, you think we're going to create Skynet? Come on. Well, if you have, if you, if you have a, 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 essentially an evolving system, you're going to have less and less... Even if you write uh, what is essentially a bug-filled system over time with essentially what's essentially a process of evolution, you would get rid of those bugs sooner or later. And that's that's the problematic thing that many of those... Well, you would hope the uh, the AI would be able to self-diagnose its own yeah, bugs and fix them? No, not, not its yeah. own bugs but it would know what the previous version wrote for itself and would know how to yeah. how to get around those bugs and write a better version next time. And then this new one would know how to write even a better version and so on and so on and so on. We're not talking about five iterations, we're talking about hundreds of iterations, thousands. And that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the idea th uh, those people have behind, like evolutionary algorithms. All right, so... Uh... To steer us back towards like uh what what uh, Derek was saying, uh, are we going to get more uh AI content in the future as you continue to go down down the rabbit hole? Like, uh, are we going to be looking into like AI generated oh, thumbnails on the YouTube I, now? I don't know if I'll ever use AI to generate thumbnails. I, I'm not against the idea. It may be. Uh, I don't mind using AI to generate some content, but. As far as I, I don't think you could have any YouTube channel that's any in any way tech related and not ever mention AI. I, I, that's for sure. That would I think uh, it, it would be impossible. So I have to talk about AI. Uh, that, I, that's true. Even I, in Linux, just in the Linux space, AI is infiltrating Linux. We have to talk about it. So. Well, uh, I know on my channel, my personal channel, not this one, I haven't done anything with AI yet. Mm -hmm. Well, but that's about as far as either. much as I've gone to. 
directly. I, it'll probably happen one I haven't, these, I guess. Yeah, I haven't used any of the image generation tools. You know, I'll admit that because I, I'm not I'm not a graphics designer or an artist or anything anyway. So I haven't played with any of the image generation tools, which I know is what a lot of people are using AI for. I'm mainly using a lot of the chat assistants, uh, generating text content. Yeah, just the large language model, and, models. And that's kind of, yeah, those, yeah, I love those because those are useful to me. And I'm not saying that I'll never use like the image generators. I probably will at some point. I just haven't got around to it. So my usage of AI for like content creation of it basically concluded with uh, it helping me pick out a name, which I didn't even then use. I just used as a basis for an act. The name was for a project that hasn't materialized yet. And, but otherwise, I really didn't do much on the use of AI for for actual like my content creation in any form even when it comes to ideas or anything here's an idea big pod when you're you since we're all content creators ask some of these large language models uh ideas for uh titles and thumbnails yeah. as far as text that's yeah. a usually they that. give you pretty they'll give you like 10 recommendations yeah. You know, seven or eight of them you probably wouldn't use, but there'll be like two or three out of that group of 10 that you'll be like, oh, that's pretty good. I'd have never thought of that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and you can even well, fine tune it. You can give them specific keywords. Maybe yeah. you're trying to target and please include this word in your suggestions. Oh, you can do a lot of really neat stuff with, with some of these chat assistants. Yeah, and uh, I I I know you could do some neat stuff. Uh, I've also like I have played around with like the uh, image generators, and I have messed around with like the video generators too. The only issue is that the one video generator I tried to do was a self, was one that you could self host. So I didn't want to pay for the CPU cycle, so I want I I attempted to self host it. They didn't have a Docker image available yet, hmm. so uh, it was one of those things where you had to pull it in and right. run like a couple dot slash scripts, and then find out that you needed some Nvidia. Uh, bull crap, which is, you know, why I got this GPU for five dollars and it still doesn't work. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> who knows? We we may or may not one of these days get an AI generated video. Uh, I intend to uh, see if I can just fully generate an AI generated video trained off of my own content, but just to see mm -hmm. what it it does. I th I think you're gonna have, I think you're gonna have a lot of this uh, AI image and video. Uh, generation tools that's already going to be built into like our video editors that's coming very soon i think there's already there are some, some AI like features ai in, features uh, but yeah those are very much like you can cut this out you can do that you can do that but i personally use none of them because everything everything yeah, I, mean, I use is it, good old-fashioned algorithms Which some people yeah, who knows you may even get that in audio are, editing yeah. as well since you're doing. Mm. Yeah, that's true. No, uh, you, you cannot can actually argue. argue that because AI, depending on which again, AI is a name for a lot of things, but none of those algorithms would actually be considered uh, AI or one one or another flavor of AI. No, well, that's a, 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 actually a really good argument against us having anything to fear with AI, because if algorithms were AI, look at the YouTube algorithm and how bad it is at filtering out spam uh, and true. autobots. I mean, well, I mean that is the shining well, example of how AI is never going to be what there is a lot no of people think one it would be. YouTube algorithm. You should also remember that there is no one YouTube algorithm, and there are many YouTube yeah, algorithms. Yeah, you have your content moderation algorithm, you got your comment moderation algorithm, you got your recommendation algorithm, you got, yeah. uh, your subscription feed algorithm, because heaven forbid that needs to be, even though there it's RSS based, there still needs to be like some algorithm for it, and uh, so on. So, uh, yeah, there there's definitely multiple things going on be behind the YouTube scenes, at, at the very minimum. Yeah. But I think yeah. we've gone gone on for long enough today. What do you guys think? I think uh, we 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 can go ahead and call call it for a wrap up. So uh, if you have any feedback about this episode specifically, we have a universal contact link that goes to just me and Big Bot. If you want to talk to Derek directly, uh, he uh, we'll we'll list some ways that you you can get in contact with him. But 
Uh, if you look here on the screen, uh, we have this wonderful thing called an email address. I know that's a foreign concept for some of you, but uh, I think we've had six uh, emails now. So for six of you, you know how to send an email. Uh, you can send us an email to contact at tuxbase.com. Make sure that you prefer, uh, phrase it as a happy email because we've had we've we've gotten plenty of angry emails now. We need a happy email to uh, restore balance restore balance to our email server. Yep. So uh, please please go ahead and send us an email about that. Hopefully hopefully it's a happy email because things should be working. If things aren't working, of course, do send us the angry email, but send us a happy email too. Uh, if you want to support our efforts, because you got to remember, at the end of the day, this podcast is fully self-hosted, and uh, we are paying money to host this podcast. Not because we're paying a content, a uh, podcast distribution platform, but because we made our own. Uh, and uh, that's not free. And uh, as we as a sh- as a show goes to scale up into the future, it's just going to get more expensive for us. So if you would like to help yeah. us in the in the efforts of funding viability, you can go to patreon.com slash no tux allowed. Sign up for one of the tiers. Our lowest tier right now is five dollars and you get a higher quality audio feed and maybe some exclusive content in that feed in the future. We don't know yet because it's still new to us. And uh of course, uh if you want to uh shout at us directly, we've got these wonderful links right here. Uh these are uh, our Fediverse addresses. Uh, we've got the that you would put put into like your Mastodon client, or if you're using the threads, you can uh, look at us from the threads there. All right, but anyways, if you want to uh, give give Derek a big thank you for coming and joining us on the show, uh, Derek, how do people just generally get in contact with you, with you these days? Well, if they're on Mastodon, they can find me at distrotube at fostodon.org on that particular Mastodon instance. Um, if they want to, they can leave me a comment on any of the YouTube videos, obviously, distrotube on YouTube. They can also comment on my videos on Odyssey if they prefer. I just get too many of them. So, yep. But uh, I mean, to be if, fair, if you want to I, message I was me legitimately about anything surprised. other than that kind of stuff, I'll probably read it. <laughs> I was legitimately yeah. surprised that you responded to me as, when I sent you the email. <laughs> <laughs> like man, that that uh, mm-hmm. came through a little bit quick. Well, I, I knew, you know, who, I imagine. Yeah. Oh, with like you or Big you Pod, you'd I be am. in my contacts anyway of people I'd email before. But if it's somebody I'd never met and they just send me a random email, usually I'll read like the first couple of sentences. Is like, oh great, you want me to shill your Windows keys service or whatever you're trying to do, or uh, you'd be surprised <laughs> what I get. All right. Well, uh, th- thanks for joining us today, Derek. It was, as always, it's, it was a lot of fun talking to you. Uh, we're going to wrap it up for this week, so uh, we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Goodbye. <laughs>